Hello and welcome to Pulmonary Hypertension. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the editor of Critical Care Nursing, made incredibly easy, and I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too, as we talk today about pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension has a couple different etiologies. The first is called primary, in which we have no known cause. I mean, there's nothing that we can point to and say, this thing caused the pulmonary hypertension. It may be associated with an autoimmune disorder or maybe with a fibrotic disease of some sort, like scleroderma, for example, but we don't really know for sure what was the cause of that pulmonary hypertension. Now, we also have secondary pulmonary hypertension, in which case we have some cause in effect, for example, liver disease, portal hypertension, for example. Dietary supplements have been associated with pulmonary hypertension. I'm sure you've seen all those ads on TVs for lawyers, you know, class action lawsuits, etc. Well, this is what it's all about, is the pulmonary hypertension as a result of that dietary supplement. Pulmonary hypertension causes the blood vessels, not the airways, the blood vessels in the lung to become narrowed. So when you take a look at these two diagrams here, I think a lot of times you take a look at the picture here, we see a picture of the lungs and we say, oh, those must be airways, normal airway, small airway. No, we're talking about the vasculature when we're talking about pulmonary hypertension. So here we have a normal blood vessel up at the top. Now let's just review a little bit as to what those different color things are around the outside. So we have different layers in the vessel. One of those, those layers is a muscular layer. And in pulmonary hypertension, the muscular layer becomes hypertrophied. Now that doesn't just, you know, when we talk about hypertrophy, a lot of times you think about muscles getting bigger. Somebody's going and lifting weights and they're getting big hypertrophied muscles. In this case, the hypertrophy though is going to start to narrow the vessel. So you see the muscular layer is bigger in that second diagram at the bottom that says pulmonary hypertension. And therefore, the lumen of that vessel is much smaller, leading to more resistance and hypertension. Now, when you take a look at the right side and the left side of the heart, there's a difference in what they can tolerate. The left side of the heart can tolerate having narrowed blood vessels. We do it all the time. Okay, so we clamp down because we're cold or because our, uh, for some other reason we need to increase our blood pressure. So we're used to having that on the left side of the heart that the systemic circulation clamps down a little bit or opens up, vasodilates or vasoconstricts. But the right side of the heart is not used to that. Normally the pulmonary vasculature is going to be open like the normal blood vessel we're seeing there at the top. So having this blood vessel constricting, and, and it's not just that the, the muscle is constricting, the muscle is hypertrophying. So seeing this smaller lumen is going to indicate that we're going to have more back pressure on that right side of the heart. The left side of the heart can tolerate more vascular resistance. The right side of the heart cannot tolerate more vascular resistance. So the right side of the heart is very apt to fail and fail quickly when patients have pulmonary hypertension. Some of the symptoms we would see is dyspnea and weakness. Dyspnea may be the first symptom that we see in this patient. Okay, now think about how this happens. So there's a, a case that I read recently about a woman who uh, went on a skiing trip and she was a, an executive in her 40s. And so she went on the skiing trip and she was getting short of breath often during the skiing trip and she thought, oh my gosh, I must really be out of shape. Now, that would be a very common thing for people to think, right? I mean, in the 40s, she's doing a primarily kind of an executive uh, desk type job. She's going out and doing a lot of exercise. Wow, I'm really out of shape. So when this dyspnea or how this dyspnea approaches the patient is usually very slow and it's, it's not something that happens overnight. So it's something that's slow and progressive over time. Therefore, often it's not noticed until the dyspnea gets so bad that now the patient has got really bad pulmonary hypertension and then our treatment options are going to be very few. 
weakness, recurrent syncope. Okay, so and those are some of the most common symptoms that we see. Some other signs could be a tricuspid murmur, jugular venous distension, or a pulsation in the jugular vein. So these would be things that you might see when you're examining that patient. Diagnostically, in about 40% of patients, we have a positive ANA. Again, this could be an autoimmune type disease. Often they have thyroid disease. HIV is associated with pulmonary hypertension. On the EKG, we might see right ventricular hypertrophy. Remember again, the right ventricle cannot tolerate having to pump against those narrowed vessels like the left side can. ST depression in the anterior leads is possible. And then in an echo, we can see that there is some changes to the right ventricle. Our treatment will be anticoagulation. As the vessels narrow and the blood starts to back up into the right side of the heart, we're going to have stasis of blood and could very well start developing clots. We don't want to have clots. Now we're going to throw those clots into the lung and then we're going to have pulmonary emboli on top of the pulmonary hypertension. Digoxin and diuretics to try and get that right side of the heart to work better. Oxygen, calcium channel blockers. This is usually our first line defense here as we put the patient on a calcium channel blocker and that's a vasodilator. So we're gonna vasodilate the pulmonary vessels. Keep in mind that calcium channel blockers are going to dilate every vessel, okay? So we wanna be assessing that and assessing blood pressure and assessing other symptoms like orthostatic hypotension. Pulmonary vasodilators, so these are very specific just to the pulmonary system, but you can see as we start to move into these, now we're starting to get into things that may require more medical care. So we have nitric oxide, and nitric oxide, the, uh, the way that that works is it's inhaled, and then it causes pulmonary vasodilation. Flolan is another one that's an IV medication that is given to cause pulmonary vasodilation. Uh, there's a, a few other ones here, Remodulin and Stray Clear. One that lo might look familiar to you is Sildenafil, which is also used for erectile dysfunction, but it's a vasodilator and it works very well in our patients who have pulmonary hypertension. So that might be another option for our patient. Ultimately, as this patient moves down the road of this pulmonary hypertension, ultimately they're going to have to have a lung transplant. There's about a 70 to 80 percent survival rate at one year. The right ventricle will start to heal itself as the lung is improved. So you start to see improvement in the cardiac function. 39 percent of patients though will develop bronchiolitis, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, hopefully we can have some improvement in our patient with lung transplant. So the key here is we want to try and find this early. Those patients who are complaining of having this dyspnea early on, maybe it's very a subtle kind of dyspnea. That's something they probably want to have checked out, even though it may just be related to them being couch potatoes and, and not getting a lot of exercise. Uh, that is a possibility, especially if they have other risk factors. Well, thanks for joining me for Pulmonary Hypertension. My name is David Woodruff, and until next time, 